Okay, so I'm going to talk about some work we've been doing the last sort of year, year and a bit, uh, and it is concerned with finding uh, groups of genes that are acting sort of biologically in concert and using more than one type of data in order to do that. Okay, so a quick outline of my talk. So I'll start with some motivations. Uh, this, is, this is essentially a, a modelling talk, so modelling is, is what I spend most of my time doing. So with a particular scientific question in mind, so we're going to build a, a Bayesian model to try and answer that. Uh, we've been running this model on a number of data sets now. I'm going to focus on one particular uh, data set, which is, is quite useful for sort of uh, illustrating uh, how, this, uh, how this method works, what you can hope to get out of it. So talk about a little bit, talk about some of the results and some of the conclusions we've reached. Okay, so I start with the definition. So that, I think, is probably a reasonable working de uh, definition of what a transcriptional module is. So what we, what we are interested in, we are interested in genes that are working biologically. So the, the sort of the, the, the grander scheme of things would be that you might want to find a group of genes that are working biologically together. You then might want to then go and try and understand the, the underlying network, that sort of thing. Uh, so you can you can find sort of groups of genes that are working together by taking your favourite you know, expression data set and clustering them. Um, but what you really want to do is try and get a better picture of, so that, that, that tells you one aspect of what's going on, but really you more. So you want to try and find genes that are not just doing the same, not just sort of pressing. You would like them to be, in this case, uh, regulated. You'd like them to share common sets of transcription factor binding sites. So they're somehow biologically working together. It's not just that they're showing you the same patterns in one single data set. So those are the things we're interested in finding. Uh, so if you've got more than one type of data, so we're going to be talking here about combining expression data and some kind of information that tells you about transcription factor binding, uh, binding, size binding, like that. And there actually, there's more than one choice that you can use there for the type of data. So we'll concentrate on one in this talk, but I'll talk a little bit about some others we've been working on. So we want to do a model that can take this into account. So I alluded to briefly, um, if you're looking for groups of genes that are acting similarly in one or more data sets, the thing you should be thinking about is thinking about clustering. Okay, so clustering is straightforward. There are a million and one methods for doing that. Uh, if you are trying to group genes together on the basis of uh, two different types of data, say, then it gets a bit more, bit more complicated. So th th there are a number of things you can do. You can cluster each data set separately and then have a look at the results to see if you've got any sort of commonalities. Um, so we're going to take a Bayesian approach here, which means you also do, um, you can rather than do the sort of the Separately, you can take products of likelihoods over the two data sets. So it's, it's almost like take treating your data set one big data vector, uh, modulo sort of run down the likelihood type for each type of data. Uh, and you could get one clustering structure that you were saying, okay, so the data clusters, the, the genes cluster the same in both data sets. Neither of those are really good fits for what we're trying to do here. So as I'll, I'll show with the types of data that we're handling, you would hope because the data are going to be considered in the same biological system, there will be some commonalities between the data sets. So it's the same biological system, there should be some common underlying structure. But you also expect there to be differences. So some genes probably are a good fit that they might group similarly over uh, the two different data sets, but some, some other genes won't. Okay, so motivated by this, uh, the innovation that we wanted to build into our model was to allow these genes a choice. We are we're going to be clustering over genes. We're going to be grouping genes together, but we're going to give them another choice apart from which cluster do you live in. And the, the, the choice is illustrated here. So each gene is going to have this extra variable R. Okay, and R is just a latent variable that has two values, one or zero, which, if you like, uh, tells you whether these genes are fused across the data sets or whether they're not fused. And this little diagram here illustrates what that means. So what we care about is we care about genes that are grouped together similarly across both our data sets. So these are going to be 
transcription data set, and a data set that tells us something about transcription factor binding. So if, if the two data sets, our genes are grouped together similarly, we have genes that are co-expressed and probably co-regulated. And that then fits nicely with our definition of transcriptional modules, and biologically it fits the intuition that these things are working together. So that would be that case. But there'll be some genes that for various reasons of um, biological noise, instrumental noise, or even just uh, the nature of the system, that won't be a good fit. And if it's not a good fit, then we really don't want to be forcing a forcing model to be buying these data. So in that case, we'd like another option which says, okay, you can switch off the fusion. In that case, our expression data can have one clustering partition. Uh, Transcription factor binding data can have another partition. They are less separate, and then everything's happy. So that could give an additional flexibility in, in the model. And then we can focus on things that fuse more, and those will be the ones, sort of by definition of what we're looking for, transcriptional modules, that we're interested in. So we can... Uh, Write down some maths and build a model. Okay, so for those of you who like graphical models, I will uh, explain that shortly. I'll just talk a little bit around, uh, around it first. So we're wanting to build in this idea. You can be easily fused on fused. And we want to build some kind of uh, model that does clustering. So in particular, we need three different clustering partitions. So the way we do that, we use the Dirichlet process models. So these are infinite mixture models. So mixture models have an infinite number of components, and you place, so it's non-parametric model, and you place a Dirichlet process prior on the top of that, which sort of controls for the complexity. The, the nice thing about those particular type of models, uh, it allows you to, so it allows you to do clustering uh, in the simple case, uh, and it allows you to learn the number of clusters you should have. So a, a problem with a lot of, a lot of clustering methods uh, is how you determine the number of clusters. So that, that just builds it straight into the model. It's, it's quite a nice feature. Uh, and what you're actually looking at here is you're looking at a, a hierarchy of Dirichlet process models. So maybe I'll just explain this a little bit. So you've got the data down the bottom. So you've got a gene expression data, transcription factor, binding site data, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. And so we model those. You can model those in various ways, and they'll have some set of um, high performance you can have to do with the priors on those things. Uh, you have choices how you do that. Again, I'll, I'll talk about, a bit more about the specific data shortly. You then have these Z variables. Okay, so these are just uh, labels that tell you for a given gene I which to you're in. Okay, and so you have those will just get a normal clustering uh, model, basic clustering method. You just each gene has one of those. You go. Uh, here you have three different things. So you've got these two will be the unfused case, and these, this one will be for the fused case. You see that? So that connects to both data sets. These just connect to one. And each gene has this uh, terrible like talked about R, which has a prior on it, which is just the prior probability of fusion. Um, then up here you have, so these are, these are mixture weights, those are mixture weights, and you have these hyperparameters which are associated with the process. Uh, you can learn those and they tell you something about the expected number of clusters. So that sort of controls the number of clusters. Uh, these things here all actually get marginalized out, so you can just solve for them analytically. So you don't really care about these. They're, they're a part of the model that's not interesting in this context. Uh, and then you can do something to learn what these values are, what this value are. This value is set input, and that actually allows you to dial up different different types of models. So if that's set to zero, you have, you, you have almost, not quite, but almost two just separate clusterings going on. Uh, if you set it to one, then that would just do the, the naive thing of just taking a product of likelihoods, just saying there's one clustering structure that's the same over both data sets. If you set it to a half, then, which is what we're going to do for the sort of the, the full version of the model, then we're allowed to learn what these R sub I values are. And so what we're hoping is that some genes will end up with R sub I being one a lot of the time, uh, and those of the genes are likely to be fused, and some of them will be having a lot of zeros, and those ones we're probably less interested in. Okay, so I'm going to, because of time constraints, skim over this. Essentially, just talk a little bit about the, the, the process of how you go from building this model and to actually getting some results. We'll talk about some results.
So models of this type, you can write down Gibbs samplers, which means you can do MCMC sampling. So uh, as with in, in previous talk with the previous model, dealing with these uh, types of data, these types of situations, you have a lot of uncertainty. So you really want to explore the parameter space rather than just trying to go for a, a best fit solution. Um, these types of model as well, so any time you're dealing with grouping things together, so clustering, or in this case, more complicated than clustering models, uh, the parameter space you're exploring will tend to be very multimodal. So you can get caught out if you're not trying to be smart about exploring. So you, can, you can MCMC sample these things. Once you've done that, uh, you actually become a victim of your own success slightly because the number of parameters you tend to get out, you, you get several parameters per gene. Uh, I'm going to show some data with just a couple of hundred genes, but you easily want to, we, we routinely run on, you know, thousand, thousand plus, and you'd like to push that up into the, you know, well into the thousands, which means you have an awful lot of parameters. You need to do something just, just to sort of summarize that a little bit, just to make, just so that you can actually produce sort of results that you can actually have a look at and understand. Um, the way we do that is we estimate... Uh, thing called the posterior similarity matrix. So all that is, is it's an, an N genes by N genes matrix, and each element tells you the probability that those two genes live in the same transcriptional module, the same group. Uh, you can also estimate, at the same time, uh, a probability of fusion for each given gene. So that is the proportion of the time where your R value is one rather than zero. So the nice thing about MCMC sampling, you can just uh, look at the frequency of samples you get and that will tell you a probability which means that and this is the sort of the, the key thing for understanding what you get out of this model for each gene you can say how likely is it that that gene is fused rather than unfused and that means that you can take a subset of the more likely to be fused genes uh, and that turns out to be very useful so you can estimate this similarity matrix and these probabilities uh, then Having done all of that, you can actually then find a, some kind of summary clustering partition. So in, in a way, it's a bit of a shame having done all this sampling, exploring all this parameter space, that you then want to sort of collapse it all down to one sort of average clustering partition. Um, it's a convenient way of handling it. You could easily drill down into uh, the uncertainties on that if it was something that you found useful. But so th there's a way that, uh, so this, this recent paper here uh, gives a, a nice theoretical result which allows you to... Um, extract optimized clustering partitions from a similarity matrix. So we run through that procedure and that, that gives us some results. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about one particular uh, pair of data sets uh, here today and, and sort of talk about their characteristics and the sorts of results we get out of them. So gene expression data is one type of data that we typically use. Um, we did uh, analysis here. It's a public data set that's well understood. It's, uh, so it's a yeast data set. And we've done various validations on synthetic data. That's, that's fine in the model, but you, you, know, you, you expect to get great results with that. Um, what you really want to do is, is to move on to biological data so that you can, sort of, you can run this on and try and understand biologically whether you're getting it. So this is just a small, uh, small yeast, uh, so galactose utilization, a uh, particularly small subset here. Um, so this is subject in the literature, and it just has um, four, four functional categories, so nice, uh, so functional categories in a, in a biological set of events. Um, and so we actually... So we use a sort of simple approach to modeling it. So there are various ways you can uh, It turns out that just discretizing it into a few levels, so three, three different levels, you nine days a day model works. I mean, almost surprising, you don't really lose much by doing that, um, which is perhaps a slightly it's, it's, it's something that's, I think, reasonably well known in the literature now. now times. So we just take, so this is the data set here, the data to make your experiments up the side, and then we've just gone, so prioritized into three levels with uh, red being over light blue being sort of regularly expressed and dark blue being under 
relatively within each gene. The other type of data we want, we want some kind of information about transcription factor binding. Okay, so that's the other part of the uh, of transcription model. It's the sort of thing that we're interested in. For that, uh, in this case, there's some chip chip data being uh, transcription factor binding activity uh, here. So you can use other things here. You can use, uh, for example, you can use sequence data uh, uh, and you can down promoter regions looking for transcriptions with known transcription factor binding sites just in terms of their sequence. Uh, um, there are similar sorts of data here. It's, uh, it's, it's something we're sort of working on at the moment. That less quality than this type of data, but it's much, much cheaper to generate. So, so that's it here. So we use, so what you're looking at here is just, uh, so this is a Matrix. So the, the red is where um, you've got activity, and the blue is where you don't have binding activity. Um, use a, a bag of words, just a fairly simple data model from sort of, uh, sort of literature mining community. Uh, it has a nice feature that can deal very nicely with sparse data, so it's, it's, it's happy just ignoring the zeros. Um, and whilst our data here are binary, this can have and uh, if these counts were greater than one, it can handle that as well, which is useful if you're using the sort of type data. Okay, so we've got some reasonably straightforward data models, but data models that actually, actually do capture what's going on in the data pretty well. Okay, so you can plug those data in and you can uh, run them and get some results, which I'll just talk a bit now. Okay, so running on this. Uh, you can uh, estimate your posterior similarity matrix. Okay, what you're looking at here is number of genes by number of genes. Uh, red is high, blue is low. Each of these is probability, and they're sorted by the uh, extracted clustering structure. So what you see is, is that uh, it does very well. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, sort of. You can see that this is biological data rather than synthetic data, and you see that you get one, two, three, sort of four five categories. Those do line up very nicely with what they're supposed to be. Um, Two genes up here that have a little bit of structure in the off diagonals here, suggesting that they want to belong here, um, but that they don't quite have the weight evidence to shift across. So that's, that's sort of a, a general feature here with this type of method that we found. Some some genes do, you know, do get left out, and if you run larger data sets, you sometimes see you see it more off diagonal structure. Um, sometimes you get cases where there are genes that might belong to more than one module, that sort of thing. But by and large, you get this nice block structure. That's great, that's what we were sort of hoping for. You want to be able to drill down with real data to see how well you're doing. You need to connect to biology. There are a number of levels you can do this at. So uh, I'm just going to talk through the next few slides, sort of drilling down from a very broad brush, a uh, single index that tells you, which is what this is, uh, and down to looking more at sort of uh, go terms, that sort of thing. So what you're looking at here, so Biological homogeneity index is uh, something that uh, data came up with a few years ago. Essentially, what this is, it is a measure of within each grouping of genes how homogeneous they are in terms of functional annotations. So, in this case, go terms. So, what you're looking for is um, you're looking for groups of genes that have the same sort of go terms appearing time and again within that grouping, uh, and that's good. It tells you that. You know, that group is doing the same thing biologically. Uh, BHI score runs from 0 to 1. Higher is better. Uh, and it's telling you something about uh, how homogeneous these annotations are. So I, I won't talk in great detail about this table, but essentially what you're looking at, so the, the our sort of full model is up here. And then you have different types of uh, ways of sort of calculating a similarity matrix. This W here, to remind you, is so that's the prior probability of the gene Fused. So here, if you set it to a half, you allow the model to decide should it be fused or not. If you set it to one, they're definitely fused. If you set it to zero, they're definitely not fused. Um, the number of genes, so the total number of genes in the analysis is 205. Um, what you can do here, so you use this probability of fusion to which should be enriched. And in fact, that's exactly what you see, exactly what you find. 
Uh, and so the, the, the take home message about this table really is that um, running this model in its sort of full incarnation allows you to pick out the genes that are, have a probability of fusion above a half, which is done here. You pull out this, this subset here, which gives you really quite a significant enrichment. Um, so in terms of this score, and what we'll see if, as we drill down to, a bit, to be a bit more specific, uh, we'll see why. Um, gives you this, this much more sort of traded set of genes that are really doing the same thing biologically. And just comparing to a variety of other sort of scores, you can do this. if you do the more simple-minded, just fuse everything. This is a reasonable score parable to so for example if you do if you run I'll use just so just so that's doing essentially uh, an MCMC based Dirichlet process clustering just on the expression data uh, then you, you're really not doing any better by doing just that very sort of naive simple minded fusion you have to do something a little bit smarter here okay uh, I'll probably just it is just highlighting, so you've got the fused genes here, go annotations here, um, the, the vertical stripes tell you where the different clusters are, the black pixels show you where you've got overrepresented go terms, so you see you're actually picking up quite a lot of sort of functional action here. So you can, you can dig down into each cluster sort of separately. I'll just talk briefly about one of those clusters. So you can actually then dig all, all the way, this is one particular cluster. So what you've got here, you've got the, the, the go ID. The p-value is the uh, p-value to do with are these um, go terms overexpressed uh, relative to just the background population of go terms in the, the whole genome. And uh, so you, you get some uh, scores here of significantly overrepresented go terms. And what we see here, this is, this is the number of counts within a cluster of 23 that you get for the fused case compared to uh, a model where you're just taking all the genes and just sort of averaging over contexts. Um, so this is actually the, the, the method of Lou et al. Uh, that's a sort of as it turns out. Uh, and and the, thing to, the thing to sort of take home from this is, is really get is you, you get enrichment here. So you get so for example these these, these sort of bold highlighted. There is one there but there's sort of you know, two there's another one down here that you can't quite see so well. You get these rich so whilst the, the groupings are small you get a much higher proportion uh, of these go terms sort of living in the what you're really doing, you're, you're sort of condensing it. You're condensing these genes down and finding the ones that really are sort of biologically homogenous. And that's a function of being able to do this gene by gene. So I'll just wrap things up now. So we have a few conclusions. So I think it, it's, it's clear, um, both from this work, but from work other people are doing as well, and it's sort of intuitively obvious, integrating different data sources is very helpful. I mean, it's helpful in a number of different biological contexts. It's certainly helpful uh, here trying to find transcriptional modules. But it does matter. It does matter how you do it. Uh, and in particular, uh, I think we've demonstrated that a gene by gene approach really is beneficial if you're doing something here. So you need to be a little bit smarter than maybe just sort of doing a naive approach. with a few credits and acknowledgements and I'd be happy to accept questions. actually compared uh, if you get similar enrichments if you just cluster the genes by expression I have two questions that and second since you use transcription for information binding information did you see if your clusters are enriched for uh, regulatory information like motifs or transcription factors uh, mm. binding to sure yeah uh, so let me So that, okay, so, yeah, so, so the answer to your first question is uh, we, we, we sort of routinely run sort of the expression only analysis. So it, this, this, for example, would be a good example of expression only. We also run, uh, uh, you actually can't quite see down, it's a bit dim. We, we do expression only clustering just using other sort of fast methods, that sort of thing. Uh, 
every time you do that, you find that expression is not as good as doing this sort of fusion. Um, it's, it's a fairly it, it's a fairly strong and clear result coming out of this that you do get something out of, out of combining the different data sets. Uh, with regard to our second question, uh, yeah, we have looked, we have looked uh, at um, which motifs are enriched. Um, it, it's probably not a prime focus, but you do, get, do tend to get motif enrichment. And in fact, that, that sort, of makes, it sort of makes sense because it's, it's almost the question you're asking in the first place. You're requiring clustering over the transcription factor information. Uh, so that, that, you know, that, that, that's almost, that almost directly encodes that, so you're, you're acquiring it by the model you're doing. But you certainly, you certainly do see that, and we see that as well with the, um, when we use sequence information as the basis rather than chip-chip data, then you get that as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have two questions. First, uh, first one is, uh, what's the capacity of this model? How many genes you can handle? Yeah, uh, so that, that depends quite strongly on implementation. Uh, so this is uh, so it's it's written in MATLAB and so this particular code is I describe it as a prototype. We now have a uh, a new version running some slightly different but basically very similar models, uh, also written in MATLAB. Um, we typically run on um, a thousand ish genes now, and doing the MCMC analysis sort of in parallel on a cluster takes uh, of order a couple of weeks. Um, the obvious way to improve that is to recode it in something like C or C++, uh, which we're, we're thinking about, but we don't mind, given how long it takes to generate these data, we don't really mind what it's going to um, In terms of the scaling, it's, it scales something like the number of genes squared. So it, it's really, it's, it's, so it's the Gibbs sampler that limits you. It's the number of genes times the number of clusters. So if you assume that if you double the number of genes, you get twice as many clusters, you squared. If that's, you, you might get a little better than that. I don't think you'll get worse performance than that. Um, I would expect, based on how much speed you tend to gain recoding in something like C, and also uh, other groups have run models not quite the same, but using sort of Dirichlet process type structures, they, they get to order 10,000 genes. And I, I think that would not be unrealistic uh, for this. But we, one, one to 2,000 is what we're, we're typically running with at the moment, and that's that. To uh, the second one is, um, you know, I, I guess I missed something. Uh, look at the expression data and the transcription fact, the binding information, and then the cluster, uh, how you relate to do the Go annotation afterwards. You look at the cluster and how the Go, annot Go terms was enriched in, within the cluster, or you integrate the Go annotation in the first place? Uh, yeah, no, so the, so the, the Go is not used in the analysis at all, so it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're, we're not cheating in that sense. So you find your you find your groups of genes. So you, if you take take your take your transcription module that you've got out, so your cluster of genes, uh, and then it's, then we just go, we take those genes and we look at what annotations you've got uh, to find the um, to find whether they're overexpressed or not. We just use a we use a hypergeometric test, the only correction for model hypothesis testing. Um, so it's it's pretty pretty rigorous. It's pretty sort of conservative. And then and so then we're looking for that occur significantly more than you'd expect by chance, and by chance means if it's just random from the background population of genes. No. Um, but the, 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 go, the go information is only used at the interpretation state. It's not, it's not in the model. The model doesn't know anything about them. Okay. Nice talk. Uh, question, can you prioritize W, uh, or have you thought about mm. that? Uh, we have indeed. We've tried that. Yeah, parameterizing W, you, you absolutely can do. So it's actually... So, the, so the, what you, you might like to do, um, you might like to learn the overall level of uh, fusion, which is, I guess is, is what you're asking. So we are imposing particular values of W here. So really what you're saying is 0 and 1 a special case, and half is some kind of inference by a value. Uh, yeah, so it's very simple to, to write down uh, Sampler for W as well. Actually, it's very straightforward. It's in it's in the appendix of our uh, paper. We tend to find it, it. We find it actually doesn't really help. It, it actually degrades the results slightly. Um, if so, what what you can get happening that there's there's a kind of a positive feedback loop. If so, if you imagine in a case where there's maybe not lots of fusion, then what actually happens is so that if there's not lots of fusion, you'll get, tend to get quite a lot of R values at zero. 
then the distance you're drawing from for W is only dependent on those values. So it'll tend to skew the distribution down so W will drop when you resample that. But then, because W has dropped, more of the R's will tend to live more at zero than one. And the, it, 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 tends to, it tends to run away a lot. And the, the, the way to fix this is to put, impose a reasonably strong prior on what you believe W to be. Um, and we've experimented with various priors that we thought might be reasonable. And, and what you, you are finding is that you, you end up really wanting to constrain the W prior so much as the middle. Uh, otherwise, the model runs away to, um, to sort of one end or the other. Uh, I think we, it's still something we think about seeing whether there's... I don't know if we're necessarily missing a trick. I think that, that it's probably a simple case that we're probably not. But wh whether there are situations where it's useful. So in particular, we're, we're extending this work to few more than data sets. And, and see, that's actually... That, that, that has some, some merit then because you can say, okay, so we've got, say, t these two data sets plus a sequence data set. And you actually find is, you know, is, do you want to live, to live with the chip data more? And then in that case, sampling from your Ws gives you exactly that. So, uh, short answer, yes, you can do it. We haven't found it particularly useful for using it now. Thank you very much. Okay.